Hi, welcome to a continuation of an introduction to unconstrained optimization. In particular, we are going to extend the results that we have derived for scalar functions of scalar arguments to the situation of scalar function of uh, vector arguments. In particular, what we did in the scalar case was that we considered critical points and we perturbed them slightly by some tiny real parameter alpha and then we investigated what what happens with the original function so the situation looked something like this so this is the function f this is the critical point uh, coincidentally it's also the minimum and then we investigated how the function evolves if we go either to the right or to the left on the real axis away from x star so now how does this extend in the vector case in fact there are two approaches one of them is that we will fix the direction and then perturb the vector variable only along that arbitrary but fixed direction. This way we in fact translated our vector problem back into the scalar setting. Another approach is that we will start in the vector setting and we will stay there so the vector d, the perturbation, will contain both the magnitude and the direction. So I will try to explain the difference between the two using a graphical an example, graphical example of a scalar function of two real variables. The function could look something like this. The critical point, and in fact a minimum, is right over here, x star. So this is the shape of the, of the function. And now, uh, the first approach uh, corresponds to the situation that I simply fix the direction in the plane, in the x1 y, x and x2 plane, and then only investigate how function changes if I perturb the vector variable x away from x star only along the orange line. The other approach can be explained as if I was uh, considering perturbation in all directions and sizes around x star simultaneously. But now let's keep uh, uh, or let's uh, start with the first approach. We will relabel uh, the function f as g because it, then it's just alpha that is a free parameter x star and d are fixed and we analyze how it uh, changes around zero. Uh, obviously the necessary condition of minimality of g at zero is that the first derivative must vanish there. If we now translate it back to what this means for the f function, note that we need to invoke the rule for uh, for total derivatives or simply chain rule. In this particular case this is what we get, right? Uh, which we can rewrite in a compact uh, vector form like this. Gradient transposed times d where d is a full vector. If I now evaluate this total derivative at alpha equal to zero, that means at the critical point, the above expression specializes to just gradient of f evaluated at x star and inner product with the vector d. So the first order necessary conditions are obviously that the gradient must be equal to zero. So pretty straightforward generalization of what we know from scalar functions of scalar arguments. Note that in this course we will adhere to the convention that gradient is a column vector. You can find uh, also in some literature that they like to regard it as a row vector, but let's adhere to the column convention. The second order necessary conditions, again let's go back to our uh, function g. And we do the same that we did above, uh, it's just that now we consider the first derivative of the first derivative, so we apply this chain rule twice, and we have this double sum of uh, second partial derivatives, including the mixed terms, which again, if we evaluate at alpha equal to zero, specializes to this particular expression, again, sum of second partial derivatives, which again we can uh, rewrite in this convenient matrix vector notation as d transposed times uh, nabla squared times d, where the middle term is a matrix. We call this matrix a uh, Hessian. Now, uh, if uh, the necessary condition of optimality is that uh, the second derivative uh, 
of G evaluated at zero should be non-negative, then our quadratic matrix form should be equal to zero. But then uh, sh should be non-negative. But then this translates to the statement about the middle term, which is nabla squared, and that is that it should be positive semi-definite. And this is how we very often write it. But note that I forgot to put the upper index two there. I obviously mean that the Hessian should be non-negative. Uh, but what does it mean that a matrix is non-negative? For sure it does not mean that we uh, investigate uh, non-negativity of each individual element. Note that for uh, symmetric matrices, which is certainly the case for our Hessian, then uh, the so-called positive semi-definiteness translates to the condition on the eigenvalues, because the eigenvalues are real, so it makes sense to compare them against zero. So positive definiteness of Hessian amounts to non-negativity of its eigenvalues. And similarly, the second order sufficient conditions. Uh, gradient vanishing and Hessian strictly non-negative, which again we read as, uh, as uh, the Hessian being positive definite. That means the eigenvalues are strictly positive. Now, uh, note that all the development so far was based on the assumption that we fixed the direction and then we analyzed to one direction at a time. But now, how can we uh, do it for all directions at a time to make some conclusion about the original vector function? Uh, the approach is this. Since we, for each individual direction, uh, assume that there is such uh, epsilon, if that, such that if we stay within the distance of epsilon from the critical point, the second order term dominate, then it's natural to formulate the following minimization problem. Find the minimum of all such epsilons over all directions. In the planar case, we can formulate it as an optimization over the angles. And the question now is if such a minimum value actually exists. Let's now support this analysis using uh, an example in the two-dimensional case. So these are, this is the critical point and three example directions. In each direction, the bounds within which uh, the second order terms dominate can be generally different. So this is then the approximation. And the above uh, stated minimization problem is simply equivalent to finding the circle of uh, circle that can be inscribed. Here, obviously, the existence of such circle is, uh, is uh, quite obvious, but there is a general, very powerful theorem which addresses this situation and which answers the question if uh, the function defined, continuous function defined on a compact set has a minimum. The answer is yes, if the function is continuous and if it's defined on a compact set, the minimum exists. Note that in finite dimensions, uh, compactness of a set means that it's closed and bounded. So this uh, completes the transition to uh, all directions, but there is one caveat here. Uh, do I really mean by the above analysis that if I can show that for all fixed directions the function has a minimum, do I really mean that the original full vector uh, function or functional vector argument has a minimum there? No way. Certainly, certainly this is not the case. And it's pretty uh, tricky, I think. Let's consider the following function with which I can show you. Uh, so if I visualize the function, it's a surface of this shape. The critical point here, as you can verify by yourself, is at a zero at the origin. Obviously, this is not minimum. And yet, if you now make the slices, if you investigate how the function evolves around uh, all the directions, uh, it always looks like uh, having minimum at the point. And yet, yet the when the function is viewed as a scalar functional vector argument, it obviously does not have a minimum there. Now let me uh, finish this uh, video lecture by mentioning the other approach to to uh, analyzing first and second order, or deriving first and second order conditions. It's based on uh, treating the perturbation directly as a vector. The Taylor's expansion then can be written 
uh, as the function evaluated the critical point plus the uh, derivative times the uh, vector perturbation plus the second order term and plus higher order terms. Now after uh, struggling a little bit with reformatting the second order term, uh, what I would like to uh, emphasize here is especially the higher order terms that unlike in the scalar case here the higher order terms that we uh, represent by the O big O term here it's function of the norm of the vector perturbation and also note that our convention in this course is that the gradient is actually the transposed derivative Note these two keywords, Fréché versus Gâteau derivatives. Fréché is what we have just done, and Gâteau is related to that directional derivatives, derivative-based development that we started with today. And finally, let's have a look at how the Hessian looks like in this case. It's obviously uh, singular. So as uh, we did in the scalar case, we analyze the higher order terms. Here we see that third order derivatives are non-vanishing and therefore we can conclude that the function does not have a minimum at, at the origin.